345 patients. Ray One showed best, better visual acuity. 바렛 유니버설 2 공식이 그나마 애매가 가장 정확하게. So why do we say reversible trifocality? Good evening. I'm Dr. Jongwon Kim from BGN Jamsil Lotte Tower Eye Clinic. First of all, thank you for giving me an opportunity to make a speech in this meeting. Today, I'm going to talk about the clinical outcomes of Ray1 trifocal eye wells. We implant intraocular lens when you do cataract surgery. And nowadays, we implant multifocal eye wells to many percentage of patients who want to correct presbyopia. There are many kinds of multifocal eye wells, and the trifocal, among them, trifocal eye wells are the mostly commonly used eye wells, and it reduces spectacle dependence at all distances. Ray1 is a trifocal eye well from Rayner, which has an overall length of 12.5 millimeters. It has an aberration free aspheric optic with less glistening and square edge design. I implanted Ray1 trifocal IOL bilaterally to 345 patients and reviewed the records of 290 patients who had uh, regular checkups and had no ocular abnormalities. And among them, 195 patients were followed over one year. I compared the results of the Ray1 to other trifocal and trifocal eat off RLs. There was 106 patients who had a mix and match implantation of fine vision triumph and HP RLs, and 106 patients who had a mix and match implantation of Jice, Lara, and Lisa RLs. Uh, Ray1 trifocal RL have a plus 3.5 diopter. Add power for near vision and plus 1.75 diopter for add power for intermediate vision and has a refractive index of 1.46. Fine vision IOs have the same diopter add power as Ray1, but has a overall length, of, length is short and have a haptic angulation of five degrees. Jais IOs, Lara and Lisa have a different diopter for intermediate and near vision. And, but have the uh, same uh, refractive index with Ray1 and also zero haptic angulations. We had a questionnaire to all the patients mm -hmm. who were followed postoperatively at two months. It is about the presence of visual symptoms, glare, starburst, and halos, and the need for the glasses for near and far vision. Clinical characteristics of patients with different IO groups are summarized in here. La Lara and Lisa groups, they were the younger than other two groups and more myopic, so the IO power was lower. Post-operative monocular visual acuities and residual refractive adders among the lenses are summarized in here. And Triumph showed best uncorrected and corrected distance visual acuity, and HP showed best uncorrected near visual acuity. Ray1 also showed similar near and distance visual acuity like other trifocal IOLs. At two months post-operative follow-ups, patients who had uncorrected distance visual acuity of more than 20-25 in Ray1 groups were 87%, and 97% showed more than 20-25 when corrected. And also 88% of them showed more than J2 in uncorrected near visual acuity. Monocular defocus curve of Ray1 is very similar with that Rayner provided with increased intermediate vision, making patients feel more comfortable to transition from near to distance activities and monocular defocus curve of all the IOs are compared. And as you can see with the asterisks, Ray1 showed better visual acuity than other IOs between the minus 1.5 and minus 2 diopters 
and minus 3.5 diopters, that is intermediate and near vision. Binocular defocus curve of Ray 1 was better in all range of diopters than monocular defocus curve. And binocular defocus curve of all the groups were compared. And as you can see with the asterisk, Ray 1 showed best, better visual acuity in minus two diopters and minus four diopters. Questionnaire about the presence of visual symptoms. Ray 1 group showed more glare, stubbers, than halos than other implanted groups. And the bothersomeness about the visual symptom was least in fine vision, triumph, and HP implanted group. Ray 1 group showed statistically significant least uh, spectacle dependence in near vision, and also spectacle dependence for far vision was least, and satisfaction score about the result was best in Ray 1, but there were no statistical difference. One year post operative follow ups, Ray 1 patient who had uncorrected distance visual acuity of more than 20 to 25 in Ray 1 group were 87% and 98% showed more than 20 to 25 when corrected, and 80% of them also showed more than J2 in uncorrected near visual acuity. That was very similar results with the two months follow up of the Ray 1. So I think the long term stability, visual stability was great in Ray 1. Thank you. Um. 네, 그동안 영어로 계속 발표하셨었는데 저는 오늘 그냥 경험적인 부분 그냥 저희 병원에서 했던 거 어, 조금 안내해 드리고자 한글로 일단 말씀드리고자 한 거고요. 어, 약간 이제 실전적인 부분에 대해서 조금 언급해 드리려고 이렇게 발표를 하도록 하겠습니다. 일단 뭐 이런 순서로 갈 건데 이제 케이스를 저희가 조금 약간 준비를 했고요. 일단 뭐 아까 다그 앞에 계신 분들이 말씀해 주신 겁니다. 오버홀 다이아메트가 12.5mm라고 해서 파노픽스가 13mm거든요. 근데 훨씬 더커 보입니다. 실질적으로 보면 훨씬 더커 보여서 이게 익스, 익스체인지를 처음에 저는 생각을 했었는데 이게 쉽진 않, 않더라고요. 생각보다. 그래서 일단 크다. 그리고 어, 일단 커브 제가 이, 레이원을 선택했던 이유 중에 가장 그 주된 사항은 라이트 호스가 11% 밖에 없다. 그래서 이제 확실한 어떤 비전을 좀더 보여주는 거 아닐까 생각해서 일단 진행을 했는데, 네. 그리고 제가 써본 렌즈는 여기 이제 리사 트리, 제가 파인 비전은 안 써봤습니다. 리사 트리랑 파노틱스, 그 레이원 트리포컬 이렇게 세 가지를 약간 비교하는 방식으로 조금 설명을 한번 드리고자 이렇게 일단 진행을 하도록 하겠습니다. 이제 이, 이게 이제 그 디프렉티브 커브인데요. 디프렉티브 커브 디자인이 약간 레이너가 다르죠. 약간 더 스티프한 느낌이 있고요. 여기는 리사나 뭐 파노틱스 같은 경우는 약간 중간에 트랜지션 존 같은 구역이 존재해서 약간 랜딩 존이 약간 더 넓은 느낌이 있습니다. 약간 더 예, 정확하게 떨어지면 펑션 자체는 똑같이 나오는데 이제 그런 헷갈리게 하는 차이가 약간 있다는 거. 그리고 이제 뭐 라이트 커브는 비슷하게 나올 거고요. <웃음> 예, 저희는 이제 그 전체적인 환자 군은 한 57세 정도 평균 나왔고요. 어, 이런 평균 값을 보이고 있고 보통 410 케이스를 저희는 진행했습니다. 273명의 환자를 대상으로 했고 여자분이 훨씬 더 많아서 약간 셀렉션에 있어서 바이어스가 생기지 않았을까 이런 생각은 좀 있습니다. 그리고 보통 바이노큘러로 양쪽 다 이제 레이원을 넣은 케이스가 한 60, 67% 정도 되고요. 그 다음에 한쪽 눈 리사트리 넣고 한쪽 눈 레이원을 넣은 케이스가 한126 케이스 정도 됩니다. 근데 이렇게 한 이유 중에 하나는 우선 그 토릭이 없어요. <웃음> 이게 한계가 약간 있는 게 리미테이션. 토릭 렌즈가 없다 보니까 이게 이제 제일 비슷한 걸 찾았는데 저는 리사트리가 가장 비슷한 거 아닌가? 이 생각이 들어서 일단 둘다 하이드로필릭 재질이고 어좀 무난하게 믹스 매치가 될것 같아서 일단 리사트리를 선택해서 주로 넣었습니다. 그리고 단한만 넣은 케이스가 한 10케이스 정도 되고요. 그래서 이런 케이스를 일단 기본적으로 정리를 해봤는데 레이원을 처음 딱 넣으면 당황하는 게 ARK 찍히는 게 어마무 왔다 갔다 합니다. <웃음> 뭐 웨인지 자체가 뭐 
M에서 마이너스 2 디옵서까지 이렇게 왔다 갔다 하는데 저희가 이제 그 리프렉티브 오토 리프렉티브 케라토메터가 니덱과 캐논 두 가지 장비가 있습니다. 근데 두 가지 장비로 잠깐 비교를 해봤는데 어 니덱이 조금 더그그 그 뭐야 스탠다드 데비에이션이 더 커서 보면 더 널뛰는 방향으로 나옵니다. 그리고 그 캐논 같은 경우는 마이너스 한1 디옵서 정도가 M 의 타겟인 것 같고요. 어, 그, 그래서 저희는 MR도 다 따, 따로 이제 진행을 같이 했는데. 전, 전반적으로 보면 이제 처음에 조금 더 이게 조절력 때문에 그런 건지 더 날뛰게 이제 ARK가 찍히고 6개월 정도 지나면 그래도 어느 정도 약간 더 안정되게 나오는 편이긴 합니다. 스탠다드 데비에이션도 약간 줄고 뭐 이렇게 그런 식으로. 그리고 시력 자체도 시력 자체 뭐 니어바 MM만 맞으면 다잘 나오는 그, 그리고 인터미디까지 잘 나오는 그런 렌즈라고 보시면 되겠습니다. 그리고 이제 그 중에서 가장 정확한 공식이 뭔지 저희가 이제 저희 병원 데이터로 공식을 한번 비교해 봤는데요. 여기 바렛 유니버설 2 공식이 그나마 MA가 가장 정확하게 나오는 공식으로 나왔습니다. 그런데 이제 이 중에서 뭐 MA 딱 떨어졌을 때 이게 과연 하이프로픽을 먼저 선택을 해야 되냐 아니면 마이오픽을 선택해야 되냐에 대한 고민이 또 있었는데 예, 하이, 첫 번째 하이프로픽 되는 렌즈를 선택하시는 게 가장 애매에 가깝게 떨어진다 이렇게 보시면 될것 같고요. 그 콘트라스트 센스티비티는 이렇게 나오고 있습니다. 그래서 이제 레이원 한쪽 레이원 눈, 눈 넣은 눈하고 반대쪽 이제 리사트리 넣은 케이스를 약간 이렇게 한번 비교를 해봐, 해봤습니다. 과연 두 눈의 시력 차이는 날지 근데 안 나더라고요. 그 거의 펑션 자체는 비슷하게 나오지 않을까 이렇게 보고 있고요. 예, 콘트라스트도 거의 비슷하게 떨어지고 있습니다. 이제 이제 저희가 파노틱스를 예전에 더한 이게 2019년도에 거의 메인으로 썼던 렌즈라서 이제 그때도 토릭이 좀 늦게 나왔거든요. 그래서 약간 비교를 한번 같이 해보려고 해봤는데 이제 그 데모그래픽 처음 프리오피 파일을 어느 정도 이렇게 맞춘 상태에서 이렇게 진행을 했습니다. 타겟 디옵터는 A 컨스턴트 때문에 아마 두 가지 도수가 약간 다르게 찍힐 걸로 예상이 되고요. 그래서 어, 레이원은 363 케이스, 파노브는 1000 케이스 정도 이제 시력을 약간 비교를 해봤는데. 어 이게 보면은 어, 처음에 니어 쪽은 파노비 약간 더잘 나오는 느낌이 있고 그 다음에 파 쪽은 레이온이 조금 더잘 나오는 경향이 있는데 이게 이제 셀렉션 데비에이션이 아닌가 하는 생각이 약간 있습니다. 왜냐하면 이게 레이온 같은 경우는 아이올 마스터의 첫 번째 하이포로피아를 이렇게 초이스를 해야 되는 거고요. 파노 같은 경우는 에메트로피아 첫 번째 마이오피아를 선택을 해야 되는 거라. 이게 자꾸 이제 이렇게 이렇게 선택을 하다 보니까 데비에이션이 자꾸 이렇게 벌어지는 거 아닌가. 그래서 니어가 파노비 좀더 좋게 나오고 파는 레이원이 조금 더 좋게 나온 이런 결과가 나왔었습니다. 일단 우리 병원의 이제 실력적인 데이터는 보통 이렇게 나왔고요. 일단 오늘 시청해 주셔서 감사합니다. 아, 네. Okay, yeah, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And I'm very happy to share with you my experience with, with Reina in general, and also with the trifocal uh, Salgoflex, and the concept of reversible trifocality, I think, which is very interesting nowadays and can be applied in, in a lot of fashions. I use Reina lenses for 25 years. I have used Reina really from the beginning. I've, I've went to every phase, every type of lens, Started actually with PMMA Rayner lenses, then the first foldable, center flex, C flex, the first toric, <laughs> everything. Uh, I've done the first multifocal toric in the world actually. The very first multifocal toric lens was a Rayner lens. I implanted in Heidelberg. Now, nobody really knows that because everybody takes this for granted that you have multifocal lenses in a toric version. But in 2006, it was the very first one, a handmade, so to say, for the very first patient. And then there were a lot of innovations in just the last couple of years that reversible trifocality, the EMV, uh, which is not the topic today, have been very good uh, innovative products, pipeline products, so to say. We've actually do, did a lot of research. Every lens we researched, we did studies, we looked at it, we examined it, we sent to peer review publication, and uh, so we did quite a bit of publications on all these lenses. We just now heard about the Psychoflex. I think the concept of having a capsular bag lens and then an additional lens in the Psychos has been established. Everybody can understand. If you create a lens 
specifically made for the sulcus. It's the material, the design, the dimensions, also the form of the haptic is adapted to the location, then this is a very good solution. And in, in Europe, we're using supplemental lenses for a long, long time, even other products for longer times. But the Cycloflex was the first really designed and especially also with the material very much adapted to this delicate space. And we already heard about the uh, Sulcofex trifocal has the same optics. So I don't need to explain all of this. I just want to point out a couple of things here. Reduction in uh, photic phenomenon. It's not depending on pupillary size so much. And you will also see some of the other features. One thing that is not really known so much, you have most the same amount of light for intermediate and near. If you look at Artelisa tree, at, uh, at uh, the Physio lens, they have in like four or five millimeters, only 8% light for intermediate, yeah, much, much less. So light goes down for intermediate and the lowest amount of light is for intermediate. And this is very balanced for the Rainer trifocal lenses and they uh, only lose a small amount of light uh, with this technology. So this is quite uh, nice. And we already heard about theory about first order, second order or minus one order. And the same technology is applied also to the Salcoflex trifocal. So it's, it's the same type of lens. So why do we say reversible trifocality? Because we have patients after surgery, they complain. They have, they have halos or uh, vision is not 100% or you have some refractive problem. And what can you do? Yeah, you can do a laser touch up sometimes, but this increases actually the side effects sometimes and they have dry eye especially if they are elderly patient and you do a touch up, they have a long time dry eye. So you don't really like that. You can explant the IOL. And if you are unlucky, you explant the capsular back and whatever else. So it's not really a good, good solution. Yeah. However, you can just think about, do I have to put in one lens and then wait and then put the other lens in? Or can I do it in one procedure, which we call the duet procedure. So two lenses in one shot. Yeah. What would be the clinical indications? If I have a patient with a young age, my very first Salcoflex trifocal patient was 24 years old. It was a juvenile cataract from a hyperferritinemia. It's a rare disease, yeah, but they, they develop very early cataract. And he's 24 years. How would be his eye length and his refraction with 46 or 56? So if I put the, this combination in, I can be sure at a later stage I can adapt. Yeah, so he get a basic monofocal lens in which covers the whole refraction and the trifocal lens has only the trifocality, no other options. But 20 years later, maybe the patient has grown a little bit myopic or hyperopic yeah, and then we can change it. And we also know that astigmatism is changing uh, over longer decades so we can adapt to that. And maybe he, this patient can experience the new version of the Rainer whatever in 20 years. Yeah, which is a non-diffractive either for all directions, I don't know. But uh, he can adapt to the newest technology and you can tell the patient, if something goes wrong, we can upgrade you. Yeah? People love to have an upgrade. Yeah? <laughs> so this is very nice. The other thing is also if he would have later on other diseases like retinal detachment. Yeah? If you have Asian population, they are myopic, they have a higher risk of retinal detachment when you do cataract surgery or when you do any kind of intraoculant surgery. So if they have that problem, uh, you can, during retinal surgery, you can remove the sulcoflex and then you have a good view and the patient still has his monofocal lens. He's not losing everything. Yeah, so this is also a very good, good thing. Or if a patient has a high refractive error, you all know if you have high refractive error, IOL calculation, maybe plus minus one diopter and not plus minus a quarter of a diopter or he still may have some myopic changes over time. Yeah? So again, you can adapt uh, to this. Or if they have some kind of little changes, I mean, none of the patients is perfect. You have cataract patients, the macula is okay, has some little changes in pigment uh, color and some drusen maybe even, but otherwise uh, you expect a good result. You can put the lens in. And if 10 years later, he deserves macular treatment, you still can remove it, uh, which you cannot do with a, a capsular back faded. So this applies to a lot of situations where you have like a borderline indication. And then of course, the whole topic of halo glare. We have a patient who 
urgently wants to have a trifocal lens. His, his neighbor, his friend has gotten it. But you know already when you talk with the patient, this is a kind of obsessive person. He may be trouble in the long run, but still you can put it in. And if everything is fine, it's good. If not, you still have the option of removing that. And then the patient will not lose the whole lens. It will just lose the trifocal part, which is also quite a uh, quite good option here for it. That's why we actually call it reversible. We, we always discuss these things, patient with otherwise healthy eyes, but they may have borderline binocular function, maybe mild amblyopia, or some of the elderly patients don't even know that they had a squint when they were a child. Yeah. Sometimes you can have a problem if you just put routinely trifocal lens in and then later they come up and have some problems. So again, here you have the possibility of uh, reversibility. And we looked at this also in my, my, my lab, the David Apple lab, because it's a different story. You would think if you have one lens in the capsular bag, one optic, or you have like two optics on each other. So you may think, oh, there's some trouble or something can happen there. So we compared the uh, Psychoflex trifocal with the Ray-1 aspheric as a duet implantation with the normal trifocal lens, which in the, in the back, so to say. What is important here, you don't need to copy all these mathematical <laughs> calculations. Yeah, don't worry about that. But what is important is the surface reflection. So we have one, two, three, four surfaces. So do we have a problem here with too much reflections? Yeah, so we evaluated that. And when we look at the typical curve, the so-called MTF, which is like the image quality of a right? There's no difference if you see the black and the, and the red line. It's, it's for far intermediate, near, uh, for different spatial frequencies, it's the same. There's no difference if you have one in the back or you have two lenses in the system. If you look at the defocus curve, it's exactly the same. Uh, United States Air Force target, everything is the same. So there's no difference if you put the trifocal lens in the back or the combination. And an interesting thing is the good optical quality of the material. We calculated the reflectance, which is, uh, with the Rayner material, 0.4%. Uh, so the transmission in, in this material is 99.6%. If you have the two IOLs, you're losing 0.8% in this combined thing with diffraction and everything. So still have 99.2%. If you take a normal Arcrisof lens, because of the hydrophobic material on the refractive index, they already lose 1.1%. And this is only one lens. So you don't need to worry about putting two together. The quality of vision is absolutely identical. There's zero, zero difference. So with the Psychofet Strikofogo, we have several possibilities. We can do the simultaneous duet implantation. So we do the cataract surgery, we put the lens in the capsule back, and then we put the Psychofet Strikofogo on it. We can do a sequential duet implantation. First, uh, the basic lens, autoric lens, and then in a, after a certain time, couple of weeks with the second lens. For example, if you have a complicated laser, post-laser case and you are not really sure, I would rather put first the monofocal lens in and then wait. And if it's like one diopter off, you put that in the Psychoflex trifocal in and then you can cover both. You can, of course, also put it in and if you are lucky, you're okay. And if you're not lucky, you exchange the Psychoflex trifocal. But it depends how complicated this case is that you don't want to go two or three times in the same eye. Another thing which is quite interesting and which may be interesting in some of the practices just to marketing this for your practice that you say, oh, you've been done surgery, monofocal lenses five, ten years ago. And then you see all the other guys coming to, to our practice, get, get a trifocal lens and can see. But you can be upgraded, so to say. We can put that in your eye and then you can also become uh, spectral independent. So that would be the the secondary so-called uh, duet implantation. So when you put the lens in, it, it actually doesn't really 100% matter which is the basic lens. I like to use uh, the Rayner lens, the Ray-1, uh, to put it in as a base lens first, but you can also use any kind of other lens or if, if, if the patient has already whatever, even an Arcrisoft doesn't matter, you still can put the Psychoflex trifocal on it. When the lens is in the capsular bag, what I usually do then is first I remove the viscoelastic from the capsular bag, and then I put again new viscoelastic in the sulcus. And uh, here we have a toric base lens, which has the advantage if I have to remove the, the trifocal optic, still the patient is 100% corrected. So I don't put a trifocal multifocal in, uh, because if the, I remove that, the patient, in addition to losing the trifocality, also losing the astigmatic correction. And in this way, actually, it, it fits very nicely to, to use the, uh, the same brand, the same name, the same material as a combination. And as I said, I put the viscoelastic out, and then we 
uh, open the sulcus with some viscoelastic here. And then we put in the, uh, the sarcoflex and the capsular bag, which is a fairly large lens uh, if you look at the haptics, uh, but it's so soft, uh, it, it goes very easily in and can be put in the capsular bag without problems. And also the secondary implantation later on, it's a, it's a two minute procedure in topical anesthesia, it's not really a big, a big deal. And I ad advocate to put the lens on the horizontal plane, which gives the best stability actually. Yeah? You may think it doesn't matter, but uh, in my experience, all supplementary lenses uh, work better uh, if they are on the horizontal plane. Uh, here you see the very long haptic, and you just spread that out. And at the end of surgery, after I remove this cholestic, I give some myocol to have the pupil smaller. I've never had an optic capture with this lens because it's like a seven millimeter optic. As a matter of fact, having a seven millimeter optic onto a six millimeter uh, uh, basic lens even is an advantage for negative dysphotopsia. Because sometimes when you have negative dysphotopsia, the cure would be to put a zero diopter sulcoflex on it because then it is covered and the patient will lose this uh, stuff. So here again, this is an advantage as well. And then it looks beautiful. Yeah? If you look both of them all together, we have very nice, nice picture. I really like to look at this because it's so aesthetic to have this, <laughs> this on there. It's quite, quite nice, actually. We did a study which we published actually in American Journal of Ophthalmology. It just came out at the end of, uh, the beginning of this year. And it's not really easy to get a paper in, in that journal. And uh, you can see here that in this du duet implantation, three months post-op, monocular, more or less, zero LOGMA, binocular, even more than zero LOGMA, uncorrected near, also zero LOGMA, even better binocular, of course, and also intermediate, zero LOGMA, or even over zero LOGMA. This is actually important. This doesn't matter. If you have a patient which is like 0.63 in one eye, 0.8 in the other eye, but binocular 1.0, that's okay. You don't need to change anything. Yeah, And we can see if we get already to here on this uh, zero LOGMA or 1.0 scale, you always will have half a line more in the binocular thing. Uh, so that is, that is very nice uh, data we had right here. You see that again uh, combined. And also if you look at the defocus curve, this is especially the binocular. You see here that the binocular curve is always half a line better than the monocular curve. And it's a very straight curve. It's not like going down and up and down and up like some of the other trifocals, it's more or less in this, I always call it the zone, yeah, like here around the zero or between zero and 0 0.1 log or something like this. So you always end up here and it goes even here, this is 0.3, so 0.5 at minus four diopters. So it's really quite a, quite a good uh, combination, which is especially for Asian eyes with a higher amount of, of, of myopic patients that have a very good near demand, so to say, it's, it's quite good outcome, really a very good outcome. Let's look at some clinical cases. Uh, this was the one I mentioned here, the 24 year old, he was a diabetes person and had this uh, uh, disease. And especially also with the diabetes, you would say, oh, you would never put that in. But a 24 year old is normally used to have full vision and can accommodate and everything. So you don't make this, this young boy a, a grandpa by putting a monofocal lens in. And even if he would have some uh, issues with the diabetes on the long run, we can just remove the lens. So that was uh, one of my first cases where I really thought this, this makes, makes sense. We see he had bad vision uh, before, we did the surgery, and uh, then here binocularly he ended up 20-20 in all directions. He had also like, here if you go at 0.1 LOGMA, he goes to four diopters of depth of focus. So it's really a very, very nice uh, outcome at 0.2 LOGMA, even almost five diopters. The funny thing is these young people don't complain about halo glare. You know, the retina is so flexible and plastic, uh, also the visual cortex, that they adapt very, very fast to it and uh, compared to like a cataract patient of, of 80. You know, the young people accommodate uh, very nicely this kind of side effects. Here is a, a typical refractive lens exchange a patient, 52 years old, spectral independence. Of course, an ideal patient because it's hyperopic. Yeah, in Germany, we have quite a bit of hyperopic patients. So the, the so-called deadly double presbyopia and hyperopia uh, is something which is an ideal candidate for this type of lenses. And you also see uh, post-operatively in all directions they had 20-20 uh, visual acuity and was, was very, very happy about this. So in general, the Ray-1 as a, as a lens, as a base lens, as a monofocal lens, and also the trifocal IOL, we have learned also in the other lectures 
is, is a very good platform. Uh, material, haptic, optic design. This evolved over 25 years. All these little things like the, the edge for the PCO, the type of uh, closed haptic that adapts to the shrinkage of the capsular bag. All these things have developed over 20 years. So it's not like a, one lens that came out. And we have all the advantages of the uh, trifocal uh, system that, that we have heard. And with the Cyclothus trifocality, we can broaden our, our profile. We have much more opportunities to adapt to the patient and get to a point where we do it, do it in application or any kind of application where the reversibility uh, is, is a very important factor. And everybody is relieved if you tell them, okay, if anything goes wrong, we can redo it in a way that it doesn't really harm your eye. You cannot say that with the acrylisa tree in the eye. Yeah? Taking that out can have some issues, or with the, with the panoptics even, yeah? which glues very much to the posterior capsule, this kind of stuff. So the reversibility is, is really good. But the thing is, you, you never really do that so often. We had like two cases in like five years where, for a specific reason, we removed the lens and exchanged the lens. But otherwise, we don't... Uh, really have a reason for it, but nevertheless, this is very interesting, young patients. And I guess you here also in, in Korea now do refractive lens exchange in 50 year old or 45 year old patients. So this, we're not talking about 80 year old grandma. Yeah. This is okay. a quite an interesting concept here. And uh, I think the longer we use this technology, the more we will have growing knowledge, but also growing indication profiles, individual cases where we say, this would be an ideal patient now. Let's try this. And if it doesn't work, we can take it out. So I think this is a very good concept. I'm really looking forward also to see the Korean experience on this on the long run. And then we can change on one of the other meetings some more information on it. So thank you very much. Is there any case of a membrane, a growing membrane between the two lenses? No. Because, yeah, uh, I, yeah. because no. in the older days, uh, and, uh, yeah. yeah, it's an important topic because yeah. uh, when they did in the United States the so called piggy bagging, yeah. they put mm -hmm. like a normal lens that you usually put in the capsule bag, mm -hmm. they just put in the cycles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have two uh, uh, convex lenses uh, 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 on each other, yeah. Yeah. and it's kind of moving, and it's also it's not really designed for the for the cycles, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And this is one optical system. And uh, um, there's absolutely zero also reports in the record now yeah. about this interlenticular specification. Uh, yeah. uh, this, uh, this is a huge difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I heard that uh, whenever put the single piece uh, lenses on the surface. Yeah, yeah. So this, ref this, this refers to the posterior chamber uh, capsule bag single piece lenses. If you if you have a posterior capsule rupture, then you can hack this off, and you have a rupture. You don't put it in the uh, in the, in the bag. You put it in the surface. You have on this lens. You have everything like sharp edge and stuff like this to prevent PCO. But you don't want to have this type of uh, design uh, directly under your, your iris. And that's why the, uh, the cycle flex uh, has uh, avoided all these features, which uh, uh, can induce some um, pigment dispersion or rubbing or something like that. Uh, that, that is the, the idea of having a specifically designed lens for the cycles and not just a normal lens you would just put there. Uh, and that is the difference. Is there any case um, of journal injury after? Circle flex surgery uh, yeah. in long term follow. No, no, I, I haven't seen that. It's a good idea actually. What you would expect if you uh, theoretically, for example, if you put an ICL in a patient who has some sonular problems, it can swap down there. But we have like a 14 millimeter, 14 millimeter overall diameter, and the the haptic is extremely long compared to a normal haptic. I don't really know how long it is, but it's very long, and. Uh, you really must have, uh, you know, hit with a, with a uh, uh, fist, yeah, and, and a huge sonular lysis to have any problems with that. So in normal cases, it's almost impossible that the lens uh, is, is going through a sonular defect. It is, I have never seen that. Yeah. I would publish it if I have. If I see it, I would put it in a journal. Yeah. But I haven't, uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen it. Yeah. No, it's, it's really not, not, not possible. Well, Rainer has 
full range of IOLs from monofocal to multifocal with TORIC and circle flags. So we could use Rayner IOLs in every cases with, with problems, complications. So I think it's great. Well, I used Ray1 tropical IOLs and I have an experience of great intermediate and near visual acuity and long-term visual stability with the Ray1. So, and actually we cannot, I couldn't use Toric IOLs in Korea. It's not available right now, but I hope to, I can use it soon in my clinic because uh, Rayner is a very uh, professional lens manufacturer company and I wanted to share my experience with doctors and Dr. Alforth had a good lecture about the circle flex. I wanted to hear about it. So that's why I came here. This is my first experience that I know about the circle flex. So uh, I think I'm going to use it in my clinic. Well, Reina is the first company in the world to produce an intraocular lenses, and I had the pleasure actually to meet the Harold Ridley, the one who implanted the first lens. And uh, Reina had his headquarters actually in Heidelberg, where I live, uh, in Germany. So for more than 25 years, I was exposed to Reina products, and I know this company since that time. I think that Reina really has evolved tremendously uh, in terms of biomaterial, design, and optical uh, developments, having a large range of intraocular lenses from monofocal, monofocal plus, trifocal, sulcoflex as a supplementary IOL, and even a trifocal uh, supplementary IOL. So it has a whole range of opportunities for the surgeon. I have been using Reina lenses since I started in ophthalmology, also more than 25 years. I went through all the phases of developments and was involved also in some of the developments. So I trust very much the product because I know where it comes from, which is very important. And uh, I've researched all the products by doing controlled studies. So in this way, I know exactly what the outcome is. And the outcome was always very good. So that's why I rely on the radar lenses. We, we heard in this uh, small symposium about the uh, experience of large scale users yeah, and a very reliable outcome and very good uh, uh, results in terms of visual acuity and low profile of uh, dysphotopsia and problems. We, we discussed very good the new concept of reversible trifocality, which I think uh, a lot of these people are now much more looking into uh, after they've seen uh, uh, the possibilities that you can do here. So I think there's a lot of uh, information people got out of it. Well, obviously, being uh, in person at these congresses uh, is new and exciting for me personally. So uh, attending APACRAS in, uh, in Seoul is, uh, is an absolute delight. Um, we're here, obviously, to support our local distributor, Cory iTech, with whom we've had a long and illustrious uh, past. But in terms of new products, uh, we're very much focused on uh, our recent acquisition of Amidria in uh, the United States. Uh, last week, we were able to announce uh, a strategic partnership with Hassa Optics, which will be uh, a really exciting and important project in the near future. And then in terms of R&D, uh, we'll soon be launching Ray1 EMV Toric, uh, and we are very busy with uh, many other exciting R&D projects centered around polyfocality and also accommodating. Uh, predominantly, actually this evening we've had a key user meeting and uh, several KOLs presenting and that's why I attend, honestly, because there isn't uh, one of these meetings I don't go to where I don't learn an awful lot. Uh, Rainer um, sits in an interesting position in the market, in my opinion. We sit between these giant companies that have large internal R&D machines and we sit above many of these smaller domestic companies. So one of our important roles in the market, I believe, is to be the, in, the partner of choice for surgeons and academics and universities who are innovators. We really want to be the company that people go to with great ideas for a new IOL that might generate $50 million of revenue because we're small enough to care about that, but we're big enough to commercialize it on a global basis. So these are the meetings where these opportunities tend to emerge.
Yeah, well, that's the question I get asked uh, most, honestly. And uh, for me, it has to be on clinical outcomes. So, you know, many of our competitors, the Alcons, the BNLs, the J&Js, they're a one-stop shop for ophthalmology. They're making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of products. We only make IOLs. That's our entire focus. So it's our passion and our responsibility to be better at that than anybody else. So when I come to events like today and I hear about Korean surgeons who are presenting data on two, three, four hundred patients using our trifocal IOLs, showing superiority over other products in the market, that's what makes us different.